We are the staff of the Homeless Rights Project at the Legal Aid Society, and um, we will be telling you, um, giving you a, a, an overview um, of the kind of work that we do about homeless rights in New York City, and then uh, we will lay, leave plenty of time for questions um, because um, we know from past uh, experience that uh, people have lots of questions and um, we want to try to answer them and give you some useful information and not just talk to you. But um, first, before we get to the individual questions, we'd like to go through um, the material that we have. Um, what you you have uh, with you right now, the whole staff of the Homeless Rights Project. Um, we're not a, a huge unit, and maybe we'll just quickly introduce ourselves and then um, go through the material. So I'm Josh Goldfine. I'm a, a staff attorney here um, at Legal Aid in the Homeless Rights Project. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I started off doing housing and public benefits and family law work, um, and um, I will pass it to uh, Catherine Cliff. I'm Catherine Cliff. I'm uh, one of the other staff attorneys in the Homeless Rights Project at Legal Aid. Um, I started out uh, as a, an Equal Justice Works Fellow in our Bronx office for 10 years, um, and I was recently moved to the Water Street office with the rest of the Homeless Rights team, um, but we're really excited to speak to you all and hope we can help answer some questions you might have. I'm going to pass it off to Steph. Hi, I'm Steph Rudolph. I use they, them pronouns or Stephanie. Um, I am the newest member of the Homeless Rights Project at Legal Aid. And prior to that, I worked um, in legal services and I also served as the director of the Source of Income Unit at um, the City Commission on Human Rights. So my expertise is in source of income discrimination, disability discrimination, and in housing vouchers and programs in New York City. I'll pass it to Jade. Hi, my name is Jade Panero. I'm a case handler at the Homeless Rights Project. Before this, um, I worked at the Prisoners Rights Project at Legal Aid, um, and it's really great to be here today. Okay, thanks everyone. So I'm um, just going to start off with a quick overview of the shelter system and who is in it. Um, and um, Jade, you have the, the magic button for the slides, yes? Okay. So the first slide we have is meant to show the growth of the shelter system over time. Um, this is this chart represents the number of people who are in two particular parts of the shelter system in the New York City Department of Homeless Services shelters and also the city agency HPD, which stands for Housing Preservation and Development. They also operate a shelter system. We'll talk about what they do, the difference in a minute. But um, we, one of the things we do in the Homeless Rights Project at Legal Aid is we are the lawyers for Coalition for the Homeless. And um, Coalition has a, has a direct services organization. They're also an advocacy organization. They're also um, a plaintiff in the right to shelter cases. Um, one of the things that they do is track the size of the shelter system. And these, this is the, um, the data that they use to do that. And so this is the number that is, uh, has been for many years kind of used in shorthand to say how many people are homeless in New York City. And again, this only refers to the people who are in shelters, um, but this is the number that you'll see usually reported in the press or talked about by elected officials. And um, the data here starts back in the mid eighties, which is really kind of the beginning of modern homelessness. Um, and you'll see that the shelter system um, grew uh, steadily along with uh, court orders that required the city to provide shelter. Um, and then there are a couple of times when uh, you'll see there are actual declines in the shelter system. And that's because the city was putting real resources into moving people out of shelter into permanent housing. Each time you see a, a decline in this chart, that's what that means. Um, when there's an increase in the chart, it means that the uh, economy was bad, that there weren't enough resources to keep people in their homes, um, that there were problems with housing subsidies. Um, but that, um, you know, the, 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 the real point of this is to say that when the government puts resources into moving people out of shelter and keeping people in their homes so they don't have to come to shelter in the first place, 
then we see real results in the shelter system. We have the ability to end homelessness in this way. Um, you'll see on the right of the chart, starting in the, um, uh, you know, around 2012, that there's a very significant growth in the shelter system. And that was because the city stopped offering any kind of subsidies at all. And as a result, people who came in had no way to get out. And the numbers of people in shelter just continued to grow. You see all the way at the right, um, first, there's a very steep decline. And that was because of the, of COVID and the pandemic and the protections that were put in place to prevent people from being evicted during that time. Um, but then that, that decline ends, um, the number kind of levels off, um, and then it shoots way up again. And that last little spike all the way on the right is the arrival of migrants from the border in New York City. And currently um, we have probably 25,000 people who have come from the border who are in different kinds of shelters in New York City right now um, just in the last few months. So this has been a major challenge for the city to deal with. All right, next slide. So um, just to highlight that there's more than one way to count the number of people who are homeless. Um, there's a, a, a publication called City Limits that also wanted to um, track people in different shelter systems. And they have been posting on their website this chart, which is helpful because you can see who is in the different, how big each section of the shelter system is. So the big dark blue box at the bottom of, of this chart um, represents people in the New York City Department of Homeless Services shelters. So just, you know, the, the vast majority of people who are in shelter are in these New York City DHS shelters. Then there is a light blue band, and that is um, the, the uh, HRA and other city agency operates domestic violence shelters. So these are the DV shelters, this, these light blue segments um, for each year or each month. Um, and uh, those shelters are in confidential locations. They are um, meant for people who are being pursued by a batterer or an intimate partner. And there are not enough of them. Um, and they fill up. Um, but you can see that um, that is the, you know, the next largest segment of the shelter population. Then there's a red uh, band here um, that represents the people who um, are in another part of HRA, um, which is called HASA, which stands for HIV and AIDS Services uh, Agency. And it serves people who are HIV positive or, ha or who have AIDS. Um, and they um, provide an enhanced shelter allowance. So most people who are clients of that agency are able to get permanent housing relatively quickly, but there's uh, some number of people who um, for a time are um, in need of some kind of shelter. Um, then we see the HPD group that we talked about before that those are people who have been evicted because of a fire or a flood, or the city has said that their building is unsafe. Um, and then there's a little green band at the top, and that is the youth shelters. There is another city agency called the Division of Youth and Community Development, which operates shelters specifically for people who are, um, for young people up to age 25. And there are a lot of different kinds of shelters, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but you can see that's the, the, the smallest group of beds um, in the city shelter system. Okay, next, thanks. Um, we also just like to point out um, who is in New York City shelters. Um, the uh, shelter population does not uh, reflect the demographics of the city as a whole. Um, the uh, people who are in shelter are overwhelmingly Black and Latinx. Um, and uh, that is, of course, a result of the institutional racism in our court system, um, in our legal system, um, and people who are most likely to be housing unstable um, uh, are uh, Black and Hispanic or Latinx. Okay, next slide. So these are the different, um, just, just a quick summary of what the different um, kinds of shelter are out there. The New York City Department of Homeless Services is the biggest um, provider of shelter, and they offer different kinds of services to different populations. 
So um, they have what we call congregate shelters for single adults. And the congregate shelters means that you don't have your own room, you are sharing your room. Um, there are There's a small number, a very small number of single rooms for single adults, um, but most people are sharing a room with anywhere from one to uh, even as many as 10 or more um, people in one dorm. Um, the next group is families with children and families with minor children get uh, their own unit. They do not share with another family. Um, they might have to share a bathroom. The, uh, the goal is to place people in shelters that are more apartment style where they have you know, a kitchen um, and a dining area and their own bathroom, but the city does not have enough space in the shelter system. And so uh, a lot of people are in hotels. And so of course, in a hotel room, you don't have a kitchen. Um, you might have your own bathroom. Um, but um, you just have one big room. And uh, there are also some shelters where people have to share other kitchens or bathrooms, um, but they all they all will always have their own bedroom. Um, the city also has a separate set of shelters for what they call adult families, which are families, but there are no minor children in the household. And the rules are different. The state only requires um, adult families to get something that's more like a hotel room. And most of them are, are in actual hotels, although there are some purpose-built shelters that are just for um, uh, adult families. Um, the Department of Homeless Services also does outreach to people who are um, unsheltered and unhoused, who are um, you know, sleeping outdoors or in subways um, or in other uh, unsuitable um, you know, non-permanent housing arrangements, they they will um, go and if they get a report that somebody is outside or in a situation like that, they will go and try to meet with them. Um, they also operate what they call drop-in centers, which are pretty much offices that are open 24 hours a day. You can come in and sit down and be out, out of the weather um, and be warm, and but, you know, you're, you're just going to have a chair and a drop-in center. They will try to uh, persuade people who are in that situation to go to a shelter, but um, a lot of people will not do that, and they will only go to a drop-in center. They also have, um, through this part of the shelter system, they have access to what they call lower barrier shelters. Um, the names of those beds, they call them safe havens or stabilization beds, and these might be places that are, they're meant to serve people who have been unwilling to come into a regular shelter. So if they confirm that you have been, um, you know, sleeping on the street or uh, in the subway or another place that, you know, people should not be sleeping um, and you haven't come into shelter in the past, they might offer you one of these places, which could be like a hotel room, or it could just be, you know, it might be a congregate site, but it's meant to have fewer people in the room and also fewer rules um, just to make it easier for people to, to uh, agree to come in um, and stay in a, in a setting that is you know, better than uh, sleeping outdoors. Um, I mentioned that DYCD operates these youth beds. They use the term uh, runaway and homeless youth um, or RHY. That's a term that comes from the law because there's a, a law that requires um, certain services to be offered for this population. Um, they may get their own room, but more likely they'll be in a congregate kind of site where there's a bunch of people in one room. Um, HPD, again, operates shelters for people who are made homeless because of a fire or a flood or a vacate order. They are much more, uh, you know, kind of apartment style. Um, and then where everybody gets their own space. And then HRA, again, operates the domestic violence um, beds. Um, for, for some single adults, they may have shared space, but most people are going to get their own their own space in that system. Um, the city posts every day on the Department of Homeless Services website um, data. If you uh, are curious to see, we have um, here the data from January 8th. And just to quickly look at the numbers to give you a sense, um, there are currently uh, almost 68,000 people in the Department of Homeless Services shelter system. Uh, you know, 19,000 of those people are migrants who recently came from the border. Um, so that's a very significant percentage of who is in shelter right now. Um, there are, if you just were to break it down into the 
three different systems that they have of single adults, families with children, and adult families. You can see that there are uh, about 20,000 um, single adults. Uh, on the family side, there's 42,000 people, and that breaks down into you know another 20,000 adults plus 22,000 children. And then on the adult family side, this is the smallest group. Um, there's about 5,500 people, and uh, they're mostly uh, couples, but they're sometimes they're intergenerational households. And this is the population that has the highest level of disability. Often, this is why they are homeless. You have um, somebody who is disabled and requires somebody else to take care of them or help assist them um, in their activities of daily living. So um, then you have two people uh, who are unable to work and uh, they're living in a very difficult financial situation. And so it's very easy for them to become homeless. Um, the city also reports things like how many people came in each day to apply. Um, that's on the right here. Um, how many people came to the drop-in centers during a day? So on January 8th, it was 609 people. Um, how many of those people stayed overnight? Um, it says faith bed census. There's a very small number of beds available in churches and other houses of worship for people overnight. Um, this used to be much larger, and they're talking about expanding it. But for the moment, you can see that out of the um, 68,000 people in shelter that night, only 14 of them were sleeping in a in a, in a faith-based kind of placement. Um, and then they report, you know, how many people they, they met out on the street, how many of them they were able to get to come in and that kind of thing. Okay, next slide. Uh, so just very quickly, um, the reason that we have a right to shelter in New York City, the reason that we have all these shelter beds is because of litigation, because of lawsuits filed by the Legal Aid Society um, Coalition for the Homeless is a plaintiff in making this happen, and so they uh, we represent them in trying to enforce this right to shelter. Um, the original case was brought in, 1980, in 1979, and it was settled in 1981. That case was brought on behalf of a man named Robert Callahan, so you will hear lots of references to Callahan as the right to shelter when, um, if you work in shelters, um, the, the coalition comes and does inspections, and those are known as Callahan inspections or Callahan's. Um, Robert Callahan's name gets uh, thrown around quite a bit. Um, a case was, uh, that, that original case was actually just brought for single men in 1979, not the way we would do things today, um, but um, a case was filed for women in, in 1983. So for all intents and purposes, uh, the same rights apply um, to everybody now, um, however they identify. Um, a case was brought in 1986 for families with children, and that was settled in 2008. And that um, case is called Boston versus the city of New York. And so there is a right to shelter also for families with children. Um, we brought a case for youth in 2013. Um, the result of that case was that the city agreed to add more beds for youth um, and also to um, uh, apply some rules to that shelter system so that they don't just kick people out, um, you know, without some kind of due process. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, we'd also just like to mention at this point um, two things. The adult families don't have their own lawsuit, but they are generally, um, uh, the rules for adult families are pretty much the same as for the families with children the you know they treat family that they have one process for families and another process for single adults and they count the adult families as families in that way uh and we'll talk about that in a little bit and then uh we also just like to highlight at this point that the city of new york does not discriminate in any way on the basis of immigration status or any public agency ever so um that includes the shelter system um you know we do know the number of migrants in the shelter system um, for um, a couple of different reasons, but um, the the city will never say to somebody, I'm sorry, you know, we need to know your immigration status before we give you shelter, or, you know, we're denying you shelter because you're not, uh, you don't have a legal immigration status. They, they don't care about that. Whoever comes to the front door should get a bed, um, and that's what the right to shelter means. And I will turn it over to my colleagues now. So 
now we're going to sort of get into a little bit more detail about the types of shelter um, that have been mentioned. So the first is single adults. Um, it's delineated into men and women because that is how the process works for intake. But you can go to whichever um, intake center and enter whichever shelter system system that best fits your gender identity. So the intake center for homeless men is at 30th Street in Manhattan. And the intake center for homeless women is um, at Franklin Avenue in the Bronx. There used to be two, um, one in Brooklyn, and there may be again, but for now there's just one in the Bronx because the Brooklyn location is being used to process um, incoming migrants seeking shelter. There's no eligibility process. Um, like Josh mentioned, um, you complete intake and then you're placed and your immigration status does not matter. Um, as I just sort of briefly mentioned, um, the shelters are funded using the binary system. So that's why they're set up that way. Um, and also because of the lawsuits that created them, but um, the placement procedure allows for a number of different accommodations or adaptations. Um, and so if you are transgender or gender nonconforming, you can request placement in a TGNC coded unit and DHS will um, make every attempt to place you in that site or they're supposed to. Um, and right now this is primarily Marsha's house, um, which is technically for 30 years old and under, but clients, um, the age is flexible. It sort of depends on the situation, the capacity available. Um, and there are more dedicated TGNC shelters and spaces being developed due to a lawsuit settlement called Lopez versus DHS. Um, trans and gender non-conforming clients may request a single room or smaller unit for safety reasons. And they also may request safety transfers um, for reasons related to their gender identity. Um, and then any other um, placements and congregate sites just in general must meet the needs of the individual client. Uh, so the next type of shelter is adult families. Um, and that, like Josh explained earlier, is two or more adults who don't have minor children. And the specifics of that can be domestic partners, married couples, and adult ch children and parents without minor children in the family. And like Josh said, they're often medically dependent, and 78% of those adult families um, have an individual in the family that re could require a special placement. And so um, typically those adult families require are, are a family unit because one of those individuals is dependent on the other for um, daily activities. Um, and this is a much smaller shelter system, as Josh also mentioned. Um, compared to the family shelter and single shelter system. And that intake center is within the single men's shelter on 30th Street, um, but it's the same location. Um, so the next type of shelter is called Runaway and Homeless Youth, not a great name, but that is the name. And it's defined as youth between 16 and 24, so it doesn't stop at 18 or 21. Um, and it's estimated that there are over 4,500 young people experiencing homelessness, but they are more difficult to count than adults or families. Um, and the majority of youth in this population are, um, have, so are either, well, the, uh, I would say a great number of them are LGBTQ, TGNC, um, Black youth and youth of color, um, young people who have had contact with the justice system and youth who've been in foster care. And um, this system is served primarily through DYCD and secondarily through DHS. So the majority of the beds are through DYCD while only a small minority of the youth beds are through DHS. There's no central intake for youth shelter. So the best way to get into youth shelter is to go to a drop-in center and to find the location of that, there's um, a phone number and a website or you can call through on one to be directed to the phone number and the website. Um, and so there's currently about 753 um, beds available through DYCD and about 60 of those are dedicated to 21 to 24 year olds um, and 500 have been added 
since um, Legal Aid filed CW. Uh, as I mentioned before, DHS is a, a much smaller proportion of uh, those beds, and it's only about 70 beds. Um, and clients may enter the shelter of their choice regardless of their sex assigned at birth, gender identity, or expression. This is just a little bit of information. I don't think it's particularly relevant um, to your reasons for participating in this training, but um, CW is uh, a lawsuit or a settlement that basically standardizes disciplinary process for um, youth and youth shelter. And that's because um, of the nature of that type of shelter, um, there the beds are very coveted. And so it became important to ensure that any sort of punitive action that would result in dismissal from shelter was conducted through a standardized process, um, especially because those beds are so important to youth and um, there are such a limited number of them that um, it's really important to ensure that people aren't ejected from those beds for the wrong reasons or no reason. And this is just a sample grievance form of that standardized process. Am I still going, Catherine, or is um, this where you? If you want to do the next couple, I can start maybe with the past stuff. Okay, great. Um, and then the last type of shelter is families with minor children. And so that's families with at least one child under age 21. So that's not 18. Um, that can also include a pregnant person or couples or adult families with a pregnant person. Um, so adult children, will usually be directed to single shelter unless they can prove that interdependence that we discussed earlier. Um, and there's different types of family shelters. Um, there's tier twos there, which um, include cooking facilities. Um, there's hotels that have been converted to shelters. There's cluster sites, private apartments, and commercial hotels, which um, are used in order to meet the standards of the settlements, even when there aren't enough officially designated beds. And this is Catherine. Hi again. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about PATH and the PATH process. Um, if you've been doing work with homeless families for a while, you're probably familiar with PATH and all of the difficult um, difficulties there are in, in navigating the system. So PATH is the intake site for families with minor children. It's the only intake site for families with minor children in the city up in the South Bronx. Um, it's usually a very busy place. Um, we've seen up to 206 families apply per day, but it can really vary depending on the time of year um, and even the day of the week in terms of how many people will be there. And it's also not a place that people like to go. Um, oftentimes people are given wrong information. The staff don't treat them very well, and they wait for a really, really long time to get processed. Uh, the city estimates that it's an eight to 12 hour process to apply for shelter at PATH, but we've seen families spend much longer than that there. Uh, and so if you do have clients going there, it's good to warn them that they're going to be there probably for many, many hours and will need to you know, miss work or school or medical appointments in order to get through the, the process there. Oh, next slide, please. Thank you. So the PATH process is complicated. Um, it, Unlike the single adult system, there is an eligibility process for shelter for families with minor children, and that's a result of the litigation in Boston that, that Josh spoke about earlier. Um, so rather than being able to just walk into the intake site and be guaranteed a bed like a single person could, families have to prove they're homeless to be found eligible. So when they come into PATH, each floor of PATH has a different function. So if you're ever speaking with a client or a patient who's having trouble with PATH and they're there, it can be helpful to ask them what floor they were on when something happened and you can figure out where they were in the process and how things might have gone awry. Um, so when clients first walk into PATH, they go to reception, which um, there is basically kind of like a mini TSA setup. You go through metal detectors um, and then you go to the, this front row of windows. It looks like the DMV. It can take you an hour just to get through those security screening to that front row of windows. Often it's very busy on the first floor. Um, again, depending on the day. And if you're there to apply for the first time, um, or even if you're reapplying, they're going to give you a sheet of paper with 
just ask for some very basic information about who you are and why you're there. Uh, and then what's really confusing for clients and for advocates is the first place you're sent after that reception floor is the fifth floor, which is called diversion or resource room. And that floor, it's not actually part of the application process in the sense that it doesn't um, doesn't isn't part of why they're investigating your eligibility. It's a place where they're there to figure out if they can offer you anything else so that you don't have to come into shelter that night. Um, so they have a variety of programs. Most of the time, they're not programs our clients um, can use or they wouldn't be a path in the first place. But if there is a place maybe you can stay temporarily, they have ways to provide funding to help you stay with a relative or friend for a short period of time while you look for housing, or maybe you have family outside of New York that you're trying to stay with, but you don't have a way to afford to get there. They can help pay for tickets for you to go there. Things like that will be offered, but everyone has a right to apply for shelter. So regardless of what happens on the fifth floor, um, you still have a right to complete an application. And the application process actually happens on the second and third floor now at PATH. So um, it is where you will meet with a worker and they will ask you about every place that you and every member of your family slept for the past two years. So for some families, that's a relatively short list. Maybe they were in their apartment for many years and the landlord raised the rent and suddenly they got evicted. And so it's only one address where they stayed. But for a lot of the families we work with, they've been in many different places over the past two years. So maybe they stayed with mom for a few months. Maybe they rented a room for six months. Maybe they were street homeless for a time. And the city is going to want to know every single place they slept. They're going to want to verify those dates and those places, and they're going to want to know why you can't go back. Um, so this is where the eligibility process comes in. They're going to want to know that you are, quote unquote, really homeless and that the city actually has to provide you shelter. So after you complete that interview on the second and third floor, they're going to send you down to the lower level, which is basically the basement of PATH, where you will likely wait for many hours while the city tries to figure out where they could place you within the shelter system. Right now, the city has a capacity crisis in the families with children system. They've had less than a 1% vacancy rate um, for many, many months. And so it takes a long time to get placed right now. You can often be waiting on that basement level for many hours. But once you're finally placed, you can be placed anywhere in the five boroughs. They try to place you in the borough of the youngest child's school, but they're only successful at doing that usually around 50% of the time. And when they place you, uh, you're in what's called a conditional placement where they investigate your eligibility. So what they're doing while you're in that conditional placement is trying to figure out if you meet their standard for being homeless and being eligible to continue to receive shelter. So they will likely send appointment notices to the family to either come back to PATH or call PATH um, and provide further information. It's really important that clients pay attention to that, um, those appointment notices, because they provide insight into what PATH is thinking and what they may decide. And if PATH is asking for something and the client doesn't provide it, they're going to be found ineligible. Um, so it's really important to pay attention to what PATH is asking for to avoid having to do this all over again. Um, so the city is also going to go and knock on the doors of the places that you say you slept in the past two years. If they're in the five boroughs, they'll call if it's outside um, the five boroughs. And they're going to want to know, why can't you go back? When exactly were you there? Um, and so it's a pretty invasive process for the tenants as well that, that the family might have stayed with. And then at the end of 10 days, the family will get a notice under their door that says whether they're eligible or not. You know, a huge proportion of the families are found ineligible the first time they apply. So it's uh, very common to have to go through this process multiple times, because if you are found ineligible, then you have to reapply and start the process all over again. And we have met families and work with families that have been found ineligible for months, sometimes over a year. It's a pretty grueling, grueling process. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Dave. Um, so NOVA stands for No Violence Again. On the sixth floor at PATH um, is where the NOVA workers are located. They're HRA workers, and their role is to assess domestic violence. So if at any point in the eligibility process, that um, long process I just <laughs> described on the prior slide, um, you mentioned that you're a victim of domestic violence or the city identifies you at such, they're supposed to put the eligibility process on hold and refer you to NOVA. And NOVA can do a few things. The first thing NOVA can do is determine whether you and your family are in such danger of being actively pursued by an abuser that they need to put you in a confidential location. And if the answer to that is yes, then they will try and get you into the HRA domestic violence shelter system that Josh mentioned early on. And that system, those locations are confidential. We don't know where they are. 
your patients or clients should not be telling you where they are. Um, it's extremely important that those sites remain confidential because the whole goal is, is to keep people safe that are being actively pursued. If you're not in a situation where you're being actively pursued, but there's still places that you shouldn't go back to because they're not safe, so maybe the person's not going to come after you, but if you live there, it's going to escalate and you could be unsafe, then NOVA can preclude those locations. So what they'll say to PATH is, PATH, you cannot consider these addresses or these locations, so don't place them in a shelter in this location, don't send them back to this address because they might not be safe. Um, NOVA has one more function, which we see a lot now. Um, if a client and their partner is in shelter and they have some kind of disagreement, the city may code that as domestic violence and refer the couple to NOVA. And NOVA is very conservative, so almost any kind of disagreement will be coded as domestic violence, and the city will say that that couple can no longer live together in shelter. So we work with a lot of clients who disagree with this assessment and say, no, we just had an argument. Um, and there are cases where NOVA has been too conservative and we have been able to help advocate to get the couple back together and explain why that wasn't domestic violence. It was simply an, an argument. Um, being in shelter is very stressful and our clients you know, do argue with their partners just like anyone. So um, if you do see cases like that, you can refer them to us and we can assess whether we can help. It's a narrow band of cases where we can get the city to overturn the decision, but we have certainly had success um, when it's very clear that the city overreacted um, in that situation. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and so just a little more detail on the domestic violence shelter system. I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. You guys will get the slides after the presentation, but this just shows how many locations they have and how many beds. It is a much smaller system than the DHS shelter system, but it is the largest domestic violence shelter system in the country. Um, and to access that system, you can either go to PATH if your family is with minor children and, and speak to NOVA there, or you can call the domestic violence hotline. Um, almost all of the DV shelter placements are for women and or women identifying clients and children. There are very few shelter beds in the DV system for singles and very few for men or male identifying clients. So just something to be aware of if you're referring clients there. It can be really hard to get in if you're not a family with minor children or if you're a large family. Um, most of the beds are for like a mother and two children or um, a woman and a child. So just something to be aware of. Unfortunately, they, they can't usually meet the need. Uh, next slide. Uh, so one thing that's become really important with the recent migrant influx, but was important even before then was language access in the shelter system. New York City has a local law, local law 30, that the city is required to provide interpretation services um, to clients seeking services and also to translate any commonly used documents into the city's um, uh, designated languages, which are here at the bottom of this slide. So if you have clients that are going to path um, or AFIC and getting documents from the city about their shelter eligibility, they should be getting those documents in their preferred language um, if it's one of the languages listed on this slide. And um, if they're not, you can feel free to reach out to us. Um, but the city has, um, has gotten much better at doing that since we raised this issue with them a few years ago. Thanks. Um, another policy that's become very relevant lately is a policy that we worked to help develop back in 2017 that protects asylum seekers and trafficking survivors in the eligibility process for shelter. What was happening was asylum seekers and trafficking survivors were being put in danger simply by applying for shelter because the eligibility process involved contacting a lot of people um, that could lead them to harm. So for example, if you're a trafficking survivor coming into PATH and all of a sudden PATH starts calling all these places you've stayed, that could put the trafficker on alert of where you are and put you in danger. Uh, for asylum seekers, the um, if PATH was calling uh, people in your home country, um, that might put people in your home country who are um, pursuing you on notice of where you are, or they might take it out on your family that's still in the home country. Also, if PATH was telling you, oh, we think you can go live back with your mom in your home country, that would mean giving up your right to apply for asylum in the United States. So it created a lot of problems. So we worked um, closely with a group of asylum advocates and anti-trafficking advocates to develop this policy, which was recently revised but the tenets of the policy are still the same. Um, it requires PATH to basically preclude any addresses connected to a trafficker or any addresses outside the United States if you're applying for asylum. 
Um, so they should not be sending any asylum seekers back to their home countries. Um, at this point in time, the city is putting all of the eligibility cases for recent migrants on hold. So this policy isn't being applied simply because the eligibility process is not being applied to the recent migrants. But if that ever changes and they do start to um, resume eligibility findings for that group, uh, this policy should apply. And it has been very helpful in keeping people safe going through the, the eligibility process. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So as we've mentioned, um, and, uh, previously, the system is experiencing a capacity crisis um, in large part due to the influx of recent migrants, um, which has been, you know, heavily, um, <laughs> heavily documented in the, in the media. Um, I don't think there's been any other topic since I've been at Legal Aid that has gotten quite as much media attention as this one. Um, so as I mentioned, the Families with Kids system is having a, a capacity crisis. And what that means is it's really hard for people to get transfers within the system. So if you need a transfer due to a disability or safety reason, even if the city agrees that's the case, it's taking a lot longer than it should to actually get you transferred to a safe place or to a place that accommodates you because they just don't have enough space right now. Um, so, you know, the as I mentioned, the migrant increase has been dra drastic and has been really difficult for the city to deal with. But we also had the eviction moratorium end about a year ago. Um, and we frequently have, you know, shelter sightings where NIMBY groups push back against the opening of shelters that all contributes to this capacity crisis. Um, the clients that are coming from the southern border have been coming primarily from Arizona and Texas. Um, obviously, if you've seen the recent news articles, there were some coming from Colorado even recently. And so that has created a lot of um, issues for the city that they've struggled with. One is a lack of translation and bilingual staff. Um, there's a huge problem in terms of the lack of immigration representation available in the city. Pretty much all of the legal services providers that provide immigration services were at capacity before this influx, and so there are just not enough immigration attorneys to take all of the cases for the people coming in. Um, and applying for asylum is a really complicated, difficult thing to do that you really shouldn't do without an attorney. So it's create um, creating a lot of a lot of problems. There's also been a lot of confusion about the role of DHS shelter versus the HERCS, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, and there's a lot of, and the city, if you are in the DHS system as a recent migrant, oftentimes they're placing you in a shelter that they call a sanctuary site where everyone in the site is a recent migrant. But those sites tend not to have the kind of comprehensive case management that shelters traditionally have, which makes it difficult for clients to get what they need. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned on the prior slide, the HERCS versus DHS has created a lot of confusion. Um, the HERCS is something the city created just over the summer as a result of the increasing number of asylum seekers coming into the city. Um, they are not DHS shelters. And what that means is they are not governed by any of the rules or regulations that DHS shelters are govern governed by. So they are a completely separate thing. Uh, that being said, the recent migrants do tend to prefer to go to the HERCS rather than DHS shelters for a variety of reasons. Um, but it's important to note that you absolutely have the right to go to DHS shelters. So a recent migrant does not have to go to a HERC. They can come into the DHS shelter system if they would like to. As I said, generally, that's not a preference of this group, but they could do so if, if they felt like the HERC was not meeting their needs. There are currently four HERCs. They are all in hotels. Um, there's the Row and the Stewart that are housing families with minor children. There's the Walcott for adult families and single women and the Watson for single men. Um, if you did see any of the press on this issue, uh, it used to be that there was a large tent on Randall's Island. Um, the photo below is, is from that tent. Um, they were using to house single men. But when the buses stopped coming as often from Texas, uh, the city decided to shut down that tent and so it no longer exists. The city has not committed to never reopening it, but we've been pushing really hard for the city to only provide actual buildings to house people um, because they're safer. And you know, a tent with 500 cots is really not the best way to provide shelter to people. Um, so as of now, the city is exclusively using hotels for the HERCs and actively trying to open more of them. Uh, next slide. So ineligibility, when you are so going back to PATH and the eligibility process, if you are found ineligible, it's usually for one of two reasons. Um, these codes are the codes that the city uses. Um, so we use them here in the presentation. XA means that somehow you failed to provide the city with all of the information they wanted. Either you couldn't prove that you were a family unit or you didn't provide your full housing history usually. 
The other main reason you can be found ineligible is XX, which means that they think that you have somewhere else to go. So they think that you are not in fact really homeless. And we list at the bottom of that prior slide just some reasons um, for how you can prove that a housing resource is no longer available, um, including overcrowding, if it's unsafe, if there's some kind of lease restriction, if there's a medical issue, very relevant to this group, if it's not safe um, from a medical perspective for someone to be there, then that can be a reason why they shouldn't consider it. Uh, next slide. So this is an XA ineligibility notice. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and as you'll see, it's a lot of language, but what it's basically saying is the city does not think that you've proved every place you've stayed in the past two years. So usually they will also give you a, a page following this, um, the language on this slide that says exactly when and where they that you haven't proved where you were. Sometimes it's a couple of weeks, sometimes it's a few months, sometimes it's the entire two years that they say they haven't been able to verify. Uh, next slide. Thanks. So how do you resolve this issue? Because this is the most common issue and most common reason people are found ineligible at PATH or at AFIC. Um, the city would prefer that everyone come in to shelter with their two-year housing history documented by way of mail every single month for each place you were. You know, ideally a lease when you moved in and a marshal's notice when you got evicted. But most of our clients don't have that. Oftentimes they're staying in places very temporarily. So the best way to resolve this issue is to get a letter from anyone who has personal knowledge of where you were. Um, and the letter has to include a few key facts. One, what is the address? What are the exact dates you were there? No approximations, but exact dates. And then a phone number where the person writing the letter can be reached. Because what will happen is PATH will take this letter and then they will call that person. If that person doesn't pick up after two times, or if that person can't remember the exact dates, the city will consider that time period unverified. So it's really important that whoever writes these letters for clients knows they need to pick up the phone and also remembers the dates when PATH calls them because otherwise the client will have to start this process all over again. And this is a process that's necessary for any housing history. So including if the person was street homeless, um, they have to get a letter from somebody who can say, you know, I know they were street homeless because they used to come shower at my place from time to time. We've seen clients, you know, speak to like the bodega owner where they were going in while they were street homeless. Oftentimes they're working with providers or um, other nonprofits who may be able to document like, yes, I saw this person sleeping outside or I know they were street homeless for this time period. Um, next slide, please. XX is the other main reason you can be found ineligible. Um, it's less common, but it's more serious because this is a situation where the city says, we know where you were, but we think you can go back. So we don't think we need to provide you shelter. Um, and they'll include an address of where they think you can go. And it's important that the client document why they cannot go there to prevent um, continuing to be found ineligible. Pre-pandemic, you would lose your shelter completely if you got a notice like this. Um, Next slide. Uh, so the standard that the city uses for um, ineligibility determinations is based on a state administrative directive and the relevant language we include here on this slide. Basically the city is looking for the applicant to provide a reasonable justification for why the person can't go back to the place where they were before. Um, so the standard itself doesn't sound so bad, but the way the city applies it is often um, very different, I think, than a lay person might assume it would be applied. So for example, if you say to PATH, I can't go live with my mom. We just don't get along. Like every time we're there, it's a huge issue. Um, you know, I really just don't feel comfortable staying there. That would not be considered a reasonable justification to them. They're going to want something more than that because they're of the opinion that you and your mom can always work it out um, and that she would never let, you know, her child or grandchildren sleep on the streets. So you guys go work it out. Um, so it's important that if clients are found ineligible on the basis of a recommended housing option, they reach out to an advocate to get help documenting why that, that resource is no longer available. Uh, next slide. Uh, you have a few options to appeal your ineligibility determination that you can either do an agency conference at PATH the morning after the determination is made. Usually those aren't very useful because it's the same organization that made the original determination, what's more common is that people request a state fair hearing. The number to request the hearing is here. These are considered emergency fair hearings because they relate to shelter and they'll be scheduled um, within just a few days. And so clients often do these hearings to try and contest their decisions. Um, 
Sometimes they're successful, oftentimes they're not. It can be really helpful to do in the sense that you get a you are entitled to a copy of the evidence the city has. And sometimes that can help, especially us advocates, figure out what's going on in the case and how to, how to resolve it. Uh, next slide. Uh, one thing that came out um, in the past few years that's been actually very helpful for our clients going through PATH is a new policy that protects families um, and limits the type of places that PATH can send people back to. Um, so it does require a heightened mediation procedure for anyone who says they can't live somewhere due to discord. Um, but it also completely bars the city from sending you back to certain places. For example, if you didn't stay there in the past two years, they can't say that you can return there. If you didn't stay for two weeks or more, they can't say that it's a housing option. Um, if the person that you stayed with is not related to you, they can't tell you to return there. Um, and if the um, primary tenant provides clear, convincing, and credible evidence, you can't stay there, they're supposed to accept that. So that has greatly limited the number of cases where PATH can find people ineligible and been very beneficial to our clients. Um, it also put into place clear standards for overcrowding, which never existed before this policy. So. Um, as a result, we do see much many fewer XX cases than we did previously, which is um, very helpful to our clients because it, it can be very difficult to overcome an XX determination. Next slide. Um, am I still... I think I'm still going. How has COVID affected eligibility? Um, families who are reapplying for shelter after being found ineligible do not need to return to the intake sites. This is huge. Pre-pandemic, every time you were found ineligible, so every 10 days, you would have to go back to PATH or AFIC to reapply and start that process all over again, which meant staying there all day long. Now, you can reapply by from your placement by phone, um, even if you are found XX. Pre-pandemic, if you were found XX, meaning they thought you had somewhere else to live, they could say to you, you can reapply, but we don't have to give you placement in the meantime. Now you can reapply by phone and stay in your placement. So that has really um, basically eliminated families having to do things like sleep on the trains or in the parks or things like that. So a huge benefit to our clients. Um, but, um, and while you do have to go to PATH or AFIC in person for the first time, you don't have to bring your children. So children, they'll FaceTime them or Skype them, but you do not have to bring them with you to PATH if you have somewhere else for them to go during that initial application. Uh, next slide. Um, just some basics on hearings during the pandemic. Those fair hearings are now happening over the phone. Uh, we include information here on how to request those fair hearings. Uh, and you also have the right to get your evidence packet by email in advance of the hearing. So we include the email address that clients can email to get a copy of that evidence packet, which can be really helpful um, if they're working with an advocate and trying to figure out what's going on with the case. Next slide. Okay, I think this, Jade, are you covering this? Thank you. Yeah, I think so. Um, so we're going to talk now about accommodations and transfers. So our lawsuit, Butler versus the City of New York, is a class action lawsuit um, that we brought on uh, against the city on behalf of disabled people in DHS shelter. The settlement was finalized in 2017, and the outcomes were improving the process, accessibility, um, policies, practices, um, and physical facilities around accommodations for people with disabilities, um, both physical and not, um, and, and as well as training staff on those rights, but more so implementing those accommodations. Um, so examples of reasonable accommodation um, needs include vision or hearing impairments, medical conditions like asthma, arthritis, cancer, MS, diabetes, or heart disease, developmental or learning disabilities, and mental health conditions like bipolar, depression, anxiety, or schizophrenia. Um, and some types of accommodations that can be made for particular conditions include shortened wait times at DHS offices, or even um, in special cases, being uh, able to not have to go in person to a DHS office and instead being able to do things remotely. Um, air conditioner during summer months, um, transferring families to medically appropriate units or facilities. So those with the physical conditions um, or adaptations that are necessary for them, like um, doorways that are wide enough to fit wheelchairs, for example providing information in an accessible format. So for example, someone who is vision impaired 
um, and special diet due to medical conditions. So that would be specialized food based on whatever their medical needs are that's different than what's regularly provided. Um, so this is sort of an overview of the initial process behind getting an RA. Um, so you have to provide a documentation for any disability or health condition that's not readily obvious or apparent. And so that standard basically refers to um, something that you can see visually. So for example, if someone uses a wheelchair, um, you wouldn't need uh, medical documentation to say that you would need um, a unit that is wide enough to fit your wheelchair. Um, but if you, for example, are, um, are a family with a child with autism and you need, for example, um, a single room um, or some accommodation that isn't necessarily obviously connected to the condition that you were requesting an accommodation for, that's when you would need medical documentation. And it can come with any, from anyone who has professional knowledge of the client's condition. It doesn't have to be a doctor. And so in a lot of cases, it can be a letter from a social worker at a hospital. Um, the ideal documentation will include relevant diagnosis and symptoms, the accommodation. And then if it's not obvious or apparent, the connection between the diagnosis and the accommodation. Um, and if applicable, if they've already um, experienced difficulties as a result of not having that accommodation, then um, the medical documentation ideally would describe the challenges that the person faces because of not having that. We have Know Your Rights materials available on our website in the link. I'm not sure if this presentation will be shared, but we can definitely um, share that link in the chat if someone wants to do that. Um, this is a sample reasonable accommodation advocacy letter, and this is what would be coming from a professional with knowledge of the client's medical situation or needs. Um, and so it basically just is, it says exactly what that bullet point list on the last side explained, which is, this is the family, um, this is where, this is the shelter that they're currently placed at, um, this is the uh, medical condition that they are experiencing. And this is what uh, the absence of an accommodation, that's how it's exacerbating this condition. And then the request. So in this case, it's someone with asthma exacerbated by heat. They describe um, how not having air conditioner has exacerbated the condition. And then they request being transferred to a facility with air conditioning. It also mentions uh, stairs as a reasonable accommodation as well. Catherine, or I is think this... Josh was going to do the next two. Thanks. Okay, so um, just uh, again quickly to go through um, how the system has changed as a response to the pandemic. Um, I think you heard Catherine talk a little bit about changes that the city made to the eligibility process. Um, on the single adult side, um, the city. Um, because so many people were living in congregate settings where they were, I mean, before COVID, the largest storm had uh, 60 people in it. Um, they knew that those people could not appropriately uh, distance themselves, uh, socially distance. Um, and so they moved people from the mm -hmm. most um, crowded sites to hotels. And um, when they did that, they uh, did not do a great job of determining who was at highest risk. So some people who have uh, a particular underlying medical conditions or disabilities are at much higher risk of dying or being seriously injured from COVID. Um, and so we ended up having to bring a case to require them to identify who were the people who were at highest risk and make sure that those people were in their own rooms um, and not at risk of contracting COVID from another shelter resident. Um, the city has um, just uh, re over the last couple of weeks gone back and finally said, you know, we think that that should not be our policy anymore. 
Um, they are willing to isolate people in their own room who are severely immunocompromised, um, but uh, they are no longer going to use the CDC's list of who is at highest risk if they contract COVID um, to determine who should get moved to a single or a double room or another place where they're uh, at lower risk. And their theory there is just now that people can get um, vaccinated. So uh, they're no longer at the same level of risk that they were at the start of the pandemic when they were moving people around. They are still operating some isolation sites where if you do test positive and, and you're in the shelter system, they will move you. Um, or people who are awaiting test results, people who have been exposed, um, they are offering testing and also vaccines in the shelters. Um, and, um, uh, you know, they, they are still um, having a, you know, a public health kind of response, uh, but uh, they are no longer um, treating COVID like it's a separate public health emergency. Go to the next slide. Um, a couple of cases that we ended up having to bring during the pandemic. Um, we brought the case that I mentioned about trying, we tried to get everybody their own single room or at a minimum um, a requirement that they screen everybody to determine who needed um, to be protected. So we, we did win that, although again, they have just finally um, told us that they're going to undo all of that because they think that the pandemic is, is effectively over um, from the point of view of how they need to manage the shelter system. Um, we brought a case on behalf of kids who were um, in shelters and during the time that school was remote, who did not have access to the internet. Um, so as a result of that, now all families with children's shelters should now be um, wired for Wi-Fi so that kids can do their homework um, in the shelters. And uh, finally, when they started to move people back from hotels to congregate sites, they were not taking into account people's disabilities. And we talked about what they're required to do there. Um, and so we went to court to get them uh, ordered to screen everybody and make sure that when they were moving people from hotels back to congregate sites, that they gave them an appropriate placement. Um, and so the result of that is that we now have in place a better procedure so that when they open or close the site and they start moving people around, um, they're going to uh, look at each person and say, you know, what, what they're supposed to do is look at each person and say, you know, do you have any disabilities or other needs that we have to accommodate in your placement? And they're supposed to um, screen for that and make sure that they are, if they're moving you, they're moving you to a place where you can uh, be served consistent with your needs. Um, Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Steph now to um, uh, go through, we'll skip this one, I think. Um, uh, oh, are we doing, sorry, do I have the sli uh, order of slides wrong? Um, I'll turn it over to Steph now and then. Uh, well, I'm not 100% uh, gonna... sure, but I'm happy to do these if you, okay. so if you, want, if you don't want to. And then like, we'll, finally, I can... we'll get to your questions. Go ahead, guys. Uh, I can do the the shelter conditions real quick, and then I'll talk about programs um, and vouchers. So just like private housing and public housing in New York shelters have, as we know, dangerous conditions at times that lead to health and safety issues and uh, medical bad medical outcomes for people. Um, these are some photos of shelter conditions. Obviously, you may have heard of, of worth, worse ones. So uh, we'll address real quick what to do about that. Um, next slide, please. So just like in private housing, you can, uh, you know, contact the shelter caseworker to sub submit a maintenance request. You can also call HPD or 311 and request an inspection. Um, there is also an office of the ombudsman, which is tends to be effective in, in motivating repairs. And there's a HRA shelter complaint hotline. Since we're going to circulate this, um, we, you know, you can keep these resources. Of course, you can also write a complaint to the to the director of the shelter. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next section is a little bit meaty, but I'm going to go quickly because we're running short on time. 
So um, if you have additional questions, one thing you can do is click the links here, and there's a lot of FAQs that help explain each program that we're going to go over. But obviously, um, exiting shelter is the goal of most people in shelter, and one of the only ways out of shelter for some families is vouchers and subsidies that assist them. Um, even if they're earning income, a lot of them may have, uh, you know, limited savings, uh, credit that is considered um, not excellent or good, which makes it really difficult to, to find housing. And so um, these programs are indispensable in helping get people out of shelter. We're going to start with the ones that are federally funded, but keep in mind they're all administered on a local level. So the most common is the Section 8 program. And the Section 8 program is a program that has had uh, its waitlist closed in New York City for a very long time. But because of the um, Biden's American Rescue Plan in response to COVID, thousands of people, uh, especially homeless people, received emergency housing vouchers. So we're going to speak a little bit about that as well. Each of these uh, Section 8 vouchers, so when you, you get a client with a Section 8 voucher or patient, the first question I usually ask them is, is what agency administers your voucher? In smaller jurisdictions, you know, the state of Nebraska might have one public housing authority, but because we are so big, we have three to five, depending on how you define it. The largest is NYCHA, which is confusing to some folks because it's also the public housing authority. Um, so NYCHA administers the most Section 8 vouchers in New York City. The second most common is HPD, which is also the same agency that inspects apartments and inspects shelters. So that can be confusing as well. And then followed by DHCR and an arm in Westchester that contracts with DHCR, DHCR called CVR. The um, Human Resources Administration also has a voucher called TRBA. Um, I hear somebody cannot hear me. Are other people having trouble hearing? Okay, I'm going to turn up my volume and see if that helps. There is also a voucher called TRBA uh, that is very, very similar to Section 8, and it is administered by HRA. There are also particular programs that um, I won't get into right now, but you may encounter for patients or clients. Um, HUD VASH for veterans and the FUP program for for youth. So that the, the Section 8 program is actually quite vast in New York City, even though it, it's very hard to get a Section 8 voucher right now. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how all of these vouchers work, but the principle behind them is that you pay 30% of your income towards rent and the rest is paid by the government. A lot of people mistake that for 30% of the rent is paid by the tenant, but it's actually 30% of the income. So one thing you want to make sure clients are doing is reporting their income because at least for federal programs, failure to report income is actually a crime and it can be considered a federal crime and people have gone to jail for it. Um, so reporting your income is very important. It also affects what your rent will be. So if you lose income, your rent can go as low as zero. Um, the other sort of programs to be aware of are state and city funded programs. One of the uh, programs that's been around a long time is called HASA. This is for clients living with HIV and AIDS. And instead of a voucher, they get something called a shopping letter, which is a one page letter that looks very fake. Um, and it really just says so-and-so qualifies for an apartment at this rent level or these rent levels, depending on how big the apartment is. And it's um, often misinterpreted by landlords or brokers as something that they've never heard about, um, or these clients are facing other kinds of discrimination, not just um, source of income, which is illegal, meaning that landlords can't discriminate against people with uh, housing vouchers, but also they cannot discriminate against people who are disabled. So for people with HASA, they may also be experiencing disability discrimination. Um, the program you may hear the most about for homeless clients or unsheltered folks is City FEPS. This is a uh, city voucher that is modeled after the Section 8 program and is very similar in many respects. Um, and in order to qualify in shelter, you have to have qualified for shelter for 90 days. Um, and then you have FEPS, which is the state version of FEPS. And whether a client qualifies for either of those two programs is actually very complicated. So I would encourage you to do a case by case analysis and to seek help um, because it's not super easy to understand. Uh, but if you click on the links, there are FAQs that explain how you can figure out if somebody qualifies. Um, 
the other program to be aware of, which is highly co co uh, controversial, is the SODA program. This is controversial because um, it used to be that they paid one year of rent upfront to a landlord anywhere in the U.S., often without inspecting the apartment. Um, now the landlord does receive uh, month by month rent, but it is one year of rent paid fully by the city and it can um, be used in any part of the United States and I think Puerto Rico. Um, the, the issue with that program is the client will need to have enough income to be able to pay the rent going forward and they don't usually have support after. Now, soda apartments are inspected in the immediate vicinity of New York, so in New Jersey and other places. Um, many clients moving with these vouchers will also receive an enhanced one-shot deal. This is money from the city to help them pay a broker fee and um, some furniture allowance. One thing to keep in mind is that uh, there is something called an HRA security voucher. It is a piece of paper in lieu of a security, a security payment for your security deposit that the landlord can cash in at the end of the tenancy if, the, if they allege the tenant did not uh, pay rent or damage the unit. But many, many landlords and brokers do not like this and will not accept it. That is illegal. And there's a clear case uh, that the Legal Aid Society worked on that uh, decided that. So if you hear that issue, um, that's something to reach out for legal support about. Uh, next slide, please. So just to go over the basic concepts with housing vouchers, um, like we talked about, tenants will pay 30 to 40% of their gross income towards rent. If they have no income at all, that means they will pay no rent. Um, and the rent for the apartment has to fall within the payment standard. Now, the city FEPS program and the FEPS program used to have very low payment standards, like a one bedroom was $1,300 or 1303. And there were very, very few apartments that people could rent for that amount and it'd be incredibly competitive. Um, but recently, City FEPS and FEPS have increased the payment standards to that of NYCHA Section 8. Um, and on the left side, you see the NYCHA payment standard. Zero bedrooms means a studio apartment and one, two, three and onwards. Um, so they're pretty decent rents um, and most programs will match those payment standards. Those numbers do include utilities. So where a apartment does not include utilities, tenants may not be able to rent for the full payment standard. We will get into that now, but it's just something to keep in the back of your head if you're helping someone search for an apartment. Um, oh, wait, go back, Jade. If you look on the right side, you'll see something called the exception payment standard. This is a um, zip code based payment standard that allows people to move into higher income and therefore higher rent areas. Um, this is specific to the HPD Section 8 voucher and all people who have received the new vouchers, the EHV vouchers, whether administered by NYCHA or HPD. So what you'll notice there is a two bedroom goes for about $4,048 near Penn Station and zip code 10001. Um, so it's a bit more complicated, but it can open up more housing opportunities in amenity-rich areas for clients. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, just keep in mind that even if you see someone with a Section 8 voucher, each agency is going to have their own process. So NYCHA might do it differently than HPD, um, and that there could be the exception payment standard. So you want to be aware of that. And it is very difficult to get a Section 8 voucher, but City FEPS um, is a program that is widely available, although some people still don't qualify, including um, people who are um, either undocumented or um, don't have certain immigration statuses. Um, we already talked about the emergency housing voucher, so we'll just talk a little bit more about um, some of the exclusions that you'll see in the Section 8 program, particularly. Section 8 um, is only available to lawful permanent residents and citizens, but they can have family members who are um, non, who do not have status, and that's called a mixed status family. Unfortunately, there are penalties in how they calculate the subsidy that may lead the family to pay more than 50% of their income towards rent and create can create a lot of issues. Um, on the federal level, there's not much we can do about it without a change in federal, uh, federal rules. However, um, there is sort of a discussion at the city level and the state level of whether that policy can be changed for city FEPs and FEPs. So um, we're, we'll keep you updated <laughs> if that changes. Um, 
as we discussed, failure to report income is considered a federal crime for Section 8 um, or can lead to, to other consequences at the local and state level um, for the city FEPS and FEPS program and other programs like that. It, for Section 8 people with certain criminal records will be excluded. That is not true for the city programs. And people evicted for not paying their particular portion of rent uh, can be terminated from the Section 8 program. So it's just important to know that um, the Section 8 program has some pretty rigorous standards for clients to keep their vouchers. So if you know of a client who's having an interaction with the criminal justice system and has a Section 8 voucher, you want to you know, make sure they're aware of what those exclusionary crimes are if they're making a, a plea deal or something like that. Uh, next slide. Um, so just some key information available about city FEPS and state FEPS. I'm not going to read it to you because it's just sort of about who qualifies and it's pretty complicated. But generally speaking, you're looking at households that are at or below 200% of the poverty level and be on cash assistance if they're eligible. Um, again, there is a 90-day requirement that the family qualifies for shelter. And as Catherine discussed, sometimes it takes a year or more to qualify for shelter. So there are people sitting in shelter for years without even getting their city steps shopping letter. And then once you get that letter, it can be very hard to find an apartment due to source of income discrimination and other challenges in finding affordable apartments within the payment standard. So um, there is advocacy to shorten that 90 day wait time to as soon as people qualify for shelter, they are awarded a city FEPS letter. That is what uh, many advocates are, are looking towards. So th that's like one of the, the major barriers for people to get out of shelter. Um, and below is just some information about who might qualify for the state FEPS program, which again, looks similar, but has some, some different rules and can create complications depending on whether you have city FEPS or state FEPS. And I think, is there any more slides, Jade? Yeah, so these are just some very helpful numbers that you can reach out to if you have an unsheltered or a homeless client or somebody in shelter. We have um, our, our client, the Coalition for the Homeless has a crisis intake number that you can call. And we also have our hotline um, that is staffed um, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And, and you may receive a call back from a lawyer. And if not, you'll be directed to the Coalition for the Hopeless. And here is our contact information. I just wanted to mention too, if you are planning to email us with a question um, about a case or anything like that, it's helpful to include all four of us on the email just because oftentimes these issues are urgent and that way, whichever one of us is available first can, can get back to you um, the quickest and try and assist if you're not sure if you should send someone to our hotline or not. But like Steph said, um, our hotline is open Monday through Friday and we do try and call back same day or next day. Um, these slides uh, will be given to you after the presentation, so you should have all this information there, um, but feel free to reach out um, with, with questions. Great. Thank you all so much. This was an incredible presentation. I know I learned a lot. Um, we have a couple questions in the Q&A, although I know you guys did an amazing job of answering a lot of the questions as they come up. Um, I'll bring those up, but um, real quick, everyone, I'm about to launch a very brief poll if you wouldn't mind filling that out. Uh, thank you so much. And then, um, so could we answer the question, what is currently being done to force landlords to take city FEPs? Most of my clients are being turned away and there's nothing that they can do for landlords to accept them. Yeah, I um, would love to answer this question. So um, one of the, the, mandates of the city commission on human rights is to enforce the city human rights law and it's been illegal to refuse a uh, city of Eps voucher, voucher since 2008 uh, when the city changed the law the state uh this the new york state commission or division on human rights uh, has also had a law against source of income discrimination since 2019 so in theory you can report to both of those agencies but in practice, they may not intervene in time because these are such um, se like sensitive situations. So a, a lot of advocates are successful in intervening um, by contacting brokers, informing them of the law, and basically saying, I will report you if you don't do the right thing. Another way that um, you can get a lot of leverage is teaching your clients how to, Jade, can you 
oh, someone did put, okay, is teaching your clients how to um, record conversations in the state of New York. It is completely legal as long as you say one word in a conversation to record it. Um, so you can record your conversations and screenshot your text messages and having immediate evidence of the discrimination is really um, important. And the last thing that can be really important is it in helping clients, if a broker basically stops responding to them once they realize they have a program or that maybe, you know, they're looking for someone who can pay an upfront deposit that, um, you know, that you can also contact that broker and make sure that they're still responding to people like you who have employment income. Um, because that's sort of an, a comparison. If the broker says, oh, I was in a tunnel or I was on vacation or I was sick, I had one broker tell me he was getting a colonoscopy. Um, but if he was responding to someone with employment income while he was having his colonoscopy, that would be a very uh, compelling uh, piece of evidence to try to push your client's deal forward or at least report that broker or landlord so they don't do it again. Um, there are also ways to bring lawsuits. Uh, you can certainly reach out to me if you see like really blatant forms of source of income discrimination or um, you have questions, but it is something that's not being enforced enough at the city and state level. And it's a real, like, it's really uh, um, impacting people's ability to get out of shelter. Thank you, Steph. Um, I also want to highlight um, Leslie in the Q&A is with We Unlock NYC. They're also um, a place where discrimination can be reported. And we actually ran a training with We Unlock maybe last summer. Um, and I'll follow up with that recording um, in an email. But Leslie, if you have any contact information or a link you wanna share, please do. And I think we have a request to put up the previous screen. Not sure if this is that screen. I yeah, I think that. That's it. Um, so there's a question here, and unfortunately, I'm not exactly sure what part of your presentation it's in reference to, but someone asked, wouldn't that be a safety transfer with the police report linked? Um, I don't know if you guys are able to, um, if, you know, if you know more about what that question was referencing. Otherwise, Agnes, if you want to provide more details. Yeah, sorry, I saw that one late, so I wasn't sure what it was referring to. Okay. Agnes, feel free to add more. Um, and as we wait for more questions, um, I'm just going to share a few more things. Thank you all for filling out um, that quick poll. I'm adding another survey in the chat um, where you can give us some more feedback on other topics for trainings that you would be interested in. We offer um, trainings monthly and um, you know, our, our, we're here to help you better serve your, your clients and patients. So let us know, it would be helpful. And I'm also sharing um, some of our upcoming trainings here in the chat as well. So we hope to see you there. We have a busy month coming up. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. We will give it a minute. Great, and Leslie added that link for We Unlock in the chat. So I definitely recommend everyone checking that out. Is it legal for realtors to charge homeless families fees for service when looking for apartments? I have a client who stated she was charged $50 to see an apartment. It is not legal. Um, there are some fee differences for co-op apartments, but um, that's sort of a gray area of law. It, I'm If there is, brokers or landlords, especially large ones, charging more than $20, um, that is illegal. I would be happy to hear about that and see if we can do anything about it. Um, one of the, the laws that changed in 2019 requires landlords to and brokers to accept as a background check or a credit check your own um, credit check. So you can actually bring one that was run within the last 30 days and you shouldn't have to pay any application fee. Unfortunately, brokers and landlords do not follow that. And I, in my own housing search, have been charged hundreds of dollars of fees, um, but it is not legal. And brokers are supposed to accept what fee the uh, city will pay them at the end of the rental process, not at the beginning. Um, so it is it is a really difficult part of the law that is not being enforced very well. Glad 
that this person asked. Um, do you have any outreach staff who could attend a community meeting at an adult women's shelter? We don't have outreach staff. You have the entire team talking to you right now, so we are very small. Um, we do work really closely with Coalition for the Homeless, who does have monitors, I think Josh talked about, that go out into the shelters regularly, do Callahan's, both scheduled and unscheduled inspections of all of the different shelters, even on the family side. Um, so I, um, I'm i not sure what the, the specific um, goals for, for the meeting are. You can always reach out to us offline and we, we can discuss, um, but we are, as you can see, relatively limited in, in our staffing. So um, we can discuss offline if that's something we could help with. Uh, is there a broker's company that specializes in helping homeless people living in shelter utilize their housing vouchers? So the way the brokerage industry is structured is not to incentivize uh, renting to people with programs because it is much more work. It takes longer and the fees, um, you know, may come later or not at all or be lower than they want. So it's actually really difficult to get brokers to work with people with programs, although there are individuals out there who want to do the right thing. And there are also brokers who have been sued and know that if they don't do the right thing, they could be sued again. Um, so the structure of the industry is, does not really create a, a great situation um, for that. And sometimes there is a broker who's like very interested in renting to people with programs. But uh, if you see that, it's great, but you just want to make sure that there isn't fraud happening. Sometimes it's an opportunity for somebody to take advantage of clients, and that's sort of why they're advertising to them. Um, so if you see it, great, but just be a little bit skeptical and make sure clients are not paying money up front and go on the Department of State website to make sure that the person they're interacting with is actually licensed by the state because um, we see a lot of people getting money stolen from brokers who purport to work specifically with people who have, say, EHV vouchers or city FAPS programs. Um, there are There is a 15% broker fee uh, for a lot of these programs, and it's 15% of the annualized rent, which can come out to $5,000 or more dollars. But, um, you know, it is sometimes also uh, a way to, to bring in uh, to like some of these brokers are, are committing fraud. So just always be cautious. All right, we're at time. I want to respect everyone's time. I know we could talk endlessly about this, um, but... I want to thank our amazing presenters from Legal Aid for offering this presentation. We'll follow up with the recording and the slides and other resources shared. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to offer another, another one of these trainings again in the future. So thank you, everyone.